Hello and welcome. I'm Jody Carlton and your host today. I'm neurotypical, which means I'm not autistic, but I've spent my entire life in relationships loving people who are autistic. Moreover, I've spent the majority of my career educating about autism and helping couples bridge the gap in neurodiverse relationships. But this podcast is for you. It's a place to talk with me, to share your struggles, talk to me about your wins, your challenges, your victories, and also hear from other professionals who really get it and understand you. So what will we talk about today? Okay, so welcome to another show. I want to remind all of you that this is your neurodiverse relationship podcast, which means I want to talk to you. And that means if you're neurodiverse, autistic, neurodivergent, Aspie, Asperger's, however it is that you like to refer uh, to yourself, or if you're a partner of someone that is one of these things, I want to talk to you. So all you need to do is just go to my website. You can go to jodycarlton.com, or you may have heard me say spectrumrelationships.com. It'll take you to the same place and just click on podcast and complete the form there to submit a request to be a guest on the show. I want to talk to you and I want to have a chat. Some of these podcasts go for 30 minutes, but don't be daunted by that. We can just have a 15 minute chat if that's what you want. And also be sure and and keep an eye out. I'm I'm probably going to be doing a call for some focus groups. I want to get a panel of people on to talk to me about some special topics. And so I'm going to be announcing those topics soon. And I'm going to be inviting people to uh, submit requests to be on that panel. So that may be uh, neurodiverse partners, neurotypical partners, professionals that will talk about specific topics for the podcast. So just keep an an ear out for that. But today I have a a special guest who is a a neurodiverse guy that I've known for a while who is in my Facebook group and he's pretty active there. And I reached out to him and said, hey, Bo, I'd really love for you to come on the podcast. And He had to think about it for a little while, but he's like, yeah, you know what? I've got a lot to share. And he sure does. So much so that we've broken his episode, uh, his show into two different episodes. And today we're going to talk a good bit about his, uh, his experiences with sensory differences. And he's just got so much to share about his perspective and his experiences. And I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from him. And I think so many of you are going to relate to what he has to say if you're autistic But also, if you're a partner of someone who's autistic, I really encourage you to listen because you are also going to hear the words of your own partner who's autistic in what Bo has to share. So I'm now going to turn it over to him. Bo, what do you want our listeners to know about you? Wow. No, Mike, that's scary. (laughs) Uh, My name is Bo, and I'm from North Georgia. I've lived in Georgia all my life. I've always liked the Asperger's. uh, designation because it makes me, uh, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to classify myself as someone who's low functioning. I think I do pretty well with my own limitations and I do recognize that I have. I think an awful lot of people in my shoes have known someone that they went to school with or in special education, but you know, basically school was a daycare when I was, when I was a kid and, uh, they, they'd rather be thought of as John Elder Robinson or, or uh, uh, what's the what's the lady uh, Temple Grandin was that her mm-hmm, name? Right. People like me have often been resistant to being labeled with a rubber stamp of autism because it's the full spectrum, and and you know it goes from the whatever you said level one to whatever it was. And Asperger sounds like well, I understand that I'm different, but I don't want to be lumped in with people who, you know, don't even know the the, the alphabet, and so. I think there's a big resistance in people like me to acknowledge or even be willing to be diagnosed because Mm -hmm. um, they've known people who were on the low end of the autistic spectrum or whatever. And they just, I mean, I guess I'd like to think that I'm intelligent enough to know that that feels like an insult. I mean, even if it's, you know, I guess it's subjective, but. uh, And you and I are, I think, fairly close to the same age, same generation. I, I think we're, we're in that same category. And so for us, the term autism was, I know for me, the first time I heard the word autism was from the movie Rain Man. Do you remember the movie Rain Man? Absolutely. I've got a poster of it in my, uh, right. Okay. Uh, in one of my bed. Uh, you, and, and, 
you know, I'm not Rain Man either. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rain Man was clearly autistic, and so was uh, Carl Childers from Sling Blade, and so was I Am Sam and and mm -hmm. uh, Chauncey Gardner from, uh, from Being There. I mean, I love all those movies, but I don't like to think of myself as being that quirky, that out of touch. And those are extreme cases, and that's, that's why they make movies. I, I get it. But it's just, I guess, you know, when I was growing, when, when I was in, 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 in elementary school, I don't think those terms existed, at least autistic. I don't, if it did, I, I wasn't aware of it. But, but dyslexic did exist. But I never wrote my letters backwards, so I didn't have the cognitive dyslexia that uh, was was the quick checkbox, was the red flag the teachers knew. Basically, when I learned about dyslexia, I thought, well, I must be in the dyslexic uh, lexicon because that seems like something that, that I could, because uh, I'm definitely different. I, I've known from very early on that I was different, and that's a weird thing to achieve so early because... We only have our own existence, so we don't know what it's like to be somebody else. But right. when you observe other people, and they don't seem to stumble with the same things that you do, or they do, or they don't seem to fixate on the same things you do, or they don't seem to be as distracted. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what dyslexia and ADD and ADHD, what they all have in common with, with autism. I don't know if they're all they're related. I don't know if they're all just different disorders. If they're just, it's easy to lump somebody in with those things. But I know that, that noises, repetitive noises would distract me like a, a Radley fan in the classroom. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I would sit through the entire class in, in elementary school and not even know that, that the class had went on. I mean, I guess it was almost like my mental recorder was shut off mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. And the teacher, you know, my mom would ask me, what did you talk about in this Bledsoe's second grade class? And it's like, I have no idea. I don't even remember being, being there. I mean, I was, I was present, but I wasn't really present. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's probably ADD or ADHD or whatever. But I, and I don't know how much that has to do with being autistic or have, or being an Aspie or whatever. I mean. Oh, it has everything to do with it. I, and, and you were mentioning dyslexia and it, all of the, all of those all of that is is visual processing auditory processing it has to do with the way the brain receives and interprets information from the senses and so the visual processing system takes in information from the the eyes and whether it's written words or numbers and then processes it and interprets it into language and so yeah. it can make errors and so sometimes it, it, there are errors of you know the way the the symbols that we use to create written language can be reversed or changed or or just even the way words are organized into some you know actual phonics or in the way we hear those words that's that's auditory processing all of those things have to do with how the brain receives information in through the senses and then interprets it all of that is is sensory processing and then what you described about the ceiling fan or the or anything any kind of distracted type noise all of that is related to sensory processing and sensory processing is an inherent criteria a, a sensory processing disorder sensory processing challenges that is a, a central part of the criteria for autism spectrum diagnosis. Right. Well, all my, teachers, all my teachers would say, you know, he seems to be very bright and he seems to be exceptional, but yet his grades don't show it. I mean, he's doing very poorly mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they were frustrated and they would talk to my mom and, you know, if only I'd written some, some backwards B's, maybe I might've, maybe they might've understood, well, he's a little special, but you know, I didn't do that. So mm -hmm. I was just a quote daydreamer. There's a great mm -hmm. Looney Tunes cartoon called, called Ralph Phillips. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about this little boy who daydreams. I don't know if you remember the cartoon. It's from, Ralph Phillips is my, probably my favorite. It's not Bugs or Daffy or whatever. It's just a, it's just a one of uh, uh, Chuck Jones' own little individual one-offs. So he actually did two of them. But Ralph Phillips was a daydreamer. And he, he, just, he sort of mind drifts off and he, 
and he, he goes into these weird tangents, just like I am right now, I guess. And, uh, I often think, I, I figure I was, I was like the little Ralph Phillips in my, my class mm-hmm. and my teacher were frustrated because, you know, they told my mom, they said, said he, he has the vocabulary of somebody twice his age. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why he, he, he's getting a 53 on his test or whatever. And it's because I wasn't even present for half of it. I mean, not, I wasn't even really aware of the, the room was, was, I was in for part of the time, probably. Mm-hmm. And some of that cleared up when I hit a certain age. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was from puberty. I don't know if that was a thyroid thing. I don't, I don't know if it was chemical. I don't have much of that. Is, and, and everybody daydreams, whether you're in the orienting. Everybody daydreams, probably. But yeah. I think it's more pronounced in us because we're easily, easily led down you know, rabbit holes, so to speak. Well, yes, but it's also a a form of, it's a dissociative thing. So dissociation is a form of coping. Uh, sometimes the, the brain dissociates when it's overwhelmed. So when that sensory information system gets bombarded with so much information, then then you may do dissociate. And daydreaming is a form of dissociation. It's, it's kind of the, it's a form of, of shutdown so it's it's like blocking out the environment, blocking out what's going on in in the world around us, in order to just be able to manage the the moment. Right. And so that it's like that kind of going to a different space and being in that other space in order to manage. So it's a coping mechanism. And one of the reasons why it gets better as you get older is because you you learn your body slowly starts to learn how to process the environment better over time. So your your body's sensory system becomes more and more efficient over time. Now, it doesn't, it, it's still, it, with, when people have autism, those sensory differences, that sensory processing system is still disordered. It's still challenged. And so there are still uh, there's still sensory overwhelm there through the lifespan. But as you get older, it does get better. So for an example, an example of this, my daughter, who, who I'm sure you've heard me talk about a good, good bit, Bo is in my I, my Facebook group, you guys, my private Facebook group. And so, uh, and, and I'm, you may have seen some of my YouTube videos too, Bo, I don't know. But um, she, so my daughter is 19 right now as, as we're recording this this podcast. And she actually eats a fair amount of different types of foods. There are certain textures, though, that she'll steer clear of that she just really can't tolerate. But when she was born, when she was a baby, she literally, her body, her brain could not process certain textures of food so badly that she would gag on them. And we, she almost had to have a feeding tube. I'm looking around because... It's almost like you've got a camera because like you're looking at my notes because food preferences slash texture issues was my next topic. Mm, that, let's that, move into that. Poorly that you, oh, well, I mean, you, you already did, I guess, but I didn't, I, I'm like, I'm like, did I mention that already? Did I already mention <laughs> food text, food preferences, texture issues? I, I, I realized, you know, that, uh, and, and I, and I didn't even, I wasn't able to articulate it at the time, mm-hmm. but I liked I liked, you know, uh, I mean, I even now, I like chicken. I don't like chicken, pressed meat, chicken nuggets. I like fish, don't like fish sticks. I like uh, ham and bacon. I don't like sausage. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I like steak. I don't like, but I don't like hamburger. Mm-hmm. And I realized it was because I guess I want to chew my own food first. I want to be the one to, it's a bit, a bit of a control thing. Mm-hmm. And also the consistency, I, I you know, having something. Something that that has been ground up and squashed back into a cube or a puck or whatever it just makes me dry heave and wretch and I didn't know if that was an Aspie thing I didn't know if that was just a me thing I mean there has to be some things about me that aren't part of my my Aspergers or my autism mm-hmm. script I mean I, there must be some weird quirks about me some OCD things that maybe aren't typical for for people on the spectrum but that is certain but if food textures and food preferences are one of those then 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 that's me i mean i once made a joke that uh that i try to eat something orange with every meal and uh i know i know that freaks out everybody and 
And I took the same lunch, uh, a brown bag lunch every day for 12 years in school. And I had the same four things. Yeah, and I, and I definitely thought, an ASCII thing. And, and it's, it's because of, okay, the boat going back to the sensory processing system, because the brain is working so hard to make sense of everything and it's an environment because the sensory system of the brain for an autistic individual is so inefficient. It's not processing all of the data that's coming in from the senses efficiently. So let's just say a neurotypical brain is processing what it's coming in, all this data, this information from the ears, the eyes, the, the, the nose, the mouth, everything's coming in and it's, it's just processing it. It's, it's saying, okay, I know what the, that is. This is what I'm interpreting. And, and it's just on autopilot and it's just functioning smoothly. But the autistic brain is like, what is that? 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 And it's, it's constantly trying to understand what it's experiencing. And so autistic individuals want the same. They want, they want no surprise. Consistency. Yes. I don't want any surprises. I want to know right. what I'm getting involved in. And, and I, now I would sometimes I'd switch out Cheetos for my, uh, for my chip or I'd have Frida or I'd have, you know, Lay's potato chips, but I, but I, but I basically I had the same four kind of things. I had peanut butter crackers and that, and a Snickers bar. And I don't remember what the other thing was now. It's hard to believe after 12 years, but, but <laughs> basically, basically I had the same four kind of things the entire time. And, and I, and I never ate lunch in the, the school cafeteria because they just terrified me because mm -hmm. I didn't have any control over it. And I, at the, the time they didn't even list what was going to be on the menu. I think they got a, some kind of a financial kickback from the county or whatever. If if you ate in the in the cafeteria, and I was always the ostracized kid who brown bagged it when everybody else didn't. And and so one the one day that I actually uh, uh, I looked on the menu and I thought they were going to have fried chicken, which I thought, well, I can I can handle that. I can I can do this. And uh, and for whatever reason, I must have looked the wrong week or something other because it was. You know, it was meatloaf or something, and I didn't even eat it. I just laid it on the tray and mm -hmm. and I let somebody else have it or whatever. But, I mean, part of it, too, is that I have a very poor sense of taste. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that I'm tasting. I mean, a lot of food that I, and, and, and I have never had anybody else's taste buds to know what I'm missing out on. But I get the feeling that mm -hmm. my sense of smell and taste are very poor compared to most people on most things. Mm. Uh, because we could be in a car and there could be, you know, going through an old country road and there could be a dead skunk and everybody else in the car would be like gagging and hacking. And I'm like, what is it? And, and they say, oh, it's a skunk. You can't smell that. And they're, they're just dying. Mm -hmm. And I can smell something, but I can't, it's not enough. And the same with taste. So mm -hmm. probably I think the equivalent of a lot of food is probably like cardboard to me. So your threshold for being able to smell and taste is very high. So something has to have a very, very, very strong odor, like really high, a strong flavor, really, really, really high for your brain to, to basically and, register right, that and, smell. And I don't want that. And that's the thing. I don't want that. I hate garlic and I hate onions. Mm. And my current girlfriend loves those things. <laughs> and we've had to make some kind of a deal about it. I mean, I know that's funny. <laughs> I only see her every two weeks, so she gets her garlic and onion soup in or whatever, you know, when we're not seeing each other. Right. It's like, please go a couple of days and don't, because I, for some reason, I must be part vampire because I can, I can smell garlic and onions, but, but I won't even smell a bouquet of roses right next to me on the couch. I mean, I, I can't, for some reason, I can't smell most things, but I can smell those things. And I don't you like have a, so I you never have like, a sensitivity to that. And. You know, that's, that brings up a good, let's, let's kind of segue into that conversation about your girlfriend there, because okay. th this is a really important topic about what, what you're bringing up here about the food sensitivities and food is, is one of our senses. It's just one. And you're talking about how you, you had that, you know, that, that you needed those routines and consistency as a kid, because you know, it, and it's because your brain needed to know, you know, it's like, I know what the peanut butter tastes like. I know what, peanut. you know, I don't have to figure that out. I know what that is. 
Um, my daughter went through the same thing. My son ha is not autistic, but he has some sensory processing differences. And that's something with, that we see in families of when, when there's autism, we of often have other people who have sensory processing differences that aren't autistic. So that's also a genetic thing. This is a very, very real and it's neurological. This is not behavioral. It's not just being a picky eater. It's not a choice. Where do you learn me in my life? Is all I can say. Right? <laughs> it made me frustrated my dad so much mm. because it, basically my dad grew up in a generation where if he was on the plate, you ate it. Right. And you finished it. And he would eat about anything. And, you know, I'd probably have to be pretty hungry. I'd probably have to be pretty starving to eat a lot of the things that he would eat. And it frustrated him. And, and, I couldn't explain it and he didn't have the patience for it. And that spilled over into relationships with outside of family into girlfriends and past a past wife mm -hmm. where they were foodies. I mean, it must be hell for somebody who's a foodie to get involved with somebody who, you know, you know, has a ritual and routine for everything. And, and I, I like a chain restaurant because I know exactly what I'm getting and mm -hmm. There's no surprises whether you eat it one in, whether you eat it one in here or in California or whatever. It's pretty much the same. They have a standard and a routine and a ritual, and I, I just I've never liked surprises. And that's the whole thing for a lot of people. It's like, well, let's go try this this new mom and pop place that has this, you know, these these uh, these uh, ethnic foods. And it's like, uh, we'll go there for you, and you and you pick out and you have everything you want and you enjoy it. And then on the way home, just stop by uh, Captain D's and get me get me a two piece because that's all I want. I understand, it. I, but 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 it, it's so important. Eating is more than eating for a lot of couples and a lot of people, mm -hmm. and they want to have the. I guess there's some kind of a bond mm -hmm. in sharing food, and uh, you know if if that's important to a, a lady, that I'm never going to be a good match for her because. Mm -hmm. You could hold a gun to my head and I would eat certain <laughs> things to make somebody happy. I've made so many mother-in-laws angry because they cook something for me. And it's like, I didn't ask you to cook that and I wouldn't eat that if my own mother. This is such an important conversation because there are a lot of neurotypical partners who are going to hear this podcast and hopefully go, okay. And, and hopefully just hear what you're saying because it really isn't your choice to have this this perspective on food this is the the neuro the way you're you're wired neurologically this well, is the way it is to be wired this way as as someone who's autistic i have have a 19 year old daughter i i see this in her i i have a, a quite a few other people in my world who are autistic and i see that this in them i dated a, a man for two years after my divorce who was autistic and he was very similar with, with his food. And I remember one time he, he was cooking uh, a chicken wings or something. He, he, he literally, um, I think it was chicken thighs. He cooked chicken thighs for dinner every single night for about three months. Well, that, even I wouldn't do that. I mean, he I, literally I, did. He had the air fryer and he put uh, them in the, the air fryer every, every single night. And so, you know, I understood it and I, but it, in, in relationships, it's so important to know, like you said, that it's not personal. It is not about, it's not about the relationship. You know, no one with autism is trying to be insulting or, or ig in ignoring their partner social, yeah, partner, or anti right. It, it, it's I not about that. something in my belly because I've and, and when you eat food and you don't even hardly can hardly taste it, and you don't want to taste it, you're just trying to feel the grumble in your stomach, and it's a social thing for so many partners. And I've learned to compromise, and it's like, well, you know what? We'll go to the Olive Garden, or we'll go to Red Lobster, or we'll, you know, and I, I actually like Red Lobster, but or we'll go to this place or this mom and pop place and mm -hmm. get what you want. And maybe I can find something. Mm -hmm. And you know, once I've eaten in a place and I found something, 
I'm good until they discontinue that dish. Then I'm screwed because I don't have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but I, but I, I don't. It's just that chains have more than one location, and you can, and they usually have the same, the same lock on the menu, the menu right? Places, but right. but I, I mean, I mean, but I, but I do, I do try. I do try. Uh, we recently went to Washington D.C. for her job, and um, while we were there, uh, we ate out a lot. And there was a lot of restaurants that I'd heard of before. Some were chains. I mean, chains I've never eaten at before, but they were big and they weren't fast food. They were more casual dining or uh, maybe even some semi upscale places. And I I can work within that as long as I can find something and I can trust that they're going to prepare it in a way that, that uh, I'm comfortable with and not put a bunch of stuff on it because I, because even if I like this and this, I don't want them together. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a food segregationist. I don't, I want my <laughs> corn over here and, yeah. and my, my potatoes over here. And there's, there's going to be a Mason Dixon line and they are not going to touch <laughs> until they get in my belly where there's no taste buds. Okay. That's how it looks in, in, in my family. We, we have, so in my family, we have uh, myself, my daughter, when she's not, when she's home from college, my son and my, my mother lives with us and we all have different palates and I'm probably the least sensory um person in terms of food and the the, the others and my mother maybe comes in second but my children both have pretty strong sensory aversions to food and my mom to a degree and so and and we're all different so when we sit down to a meal you know <laughs> All four of us will take a look at the other one's plates and just kind of, you know, wrinkle our noses because of the way everyone yep. eats and the way we combine our foods and what we put on our food is really different. And we all just have to accept that we are who we are and nobody can pressure anybody else to be any other way because it's just, it's one of those things that's not important. And once you accept that, it's not important for your partner to eat the way you do or your family to eat the way you do. I, I would, I would never, I would never insist that you eat what I eat or the way I eat. Just don't make me eat the way you eat if right. I don't want to. Right. And if it's bad, if it's bad, I'll put a, I'll put the menu. I'll stand up the menu between this. I can put like a little blinder so I don't have to look because I can't stand uncooked or, or, or mm. partially cooked steak. I mean, I, I don't want mine burnt, but I don't want it. I don't want it bloody either. And mm -hmm. my ex-wife was was all about the steak tartare kind of a thing. And I was mm -hmm. like, I can't even look at that grotesque yeah. to me. But I, I mean, you do you, and you eat what you want to eat. But I'm putting up this menu so I don't have to look at you grazing on this this still kicking body over there on on the plate. I can't stand that. But I have a I have a, a one through five scale. I have things that I love. It's a five. Things that I like, it's a four. Things that I eat, but I, I don't, I could give or take. Uh, and if I never eat again, I wouldn't care. A, a two is something that I don't like, but I don't care if other people eat it. And I, there's, there's a one, level one, it's like a DEFCON one, that things I can't stand the thought of anybody eating, and it makes me dry, even wretched just thinking about. To even think about it. Yeah, I, I can't even say the words. I wouldn't even mm. say it on the, on the podcast. So. <laughs> And that's, and that's a, that's a very, that's a strong aversion right there. And so that, that kind of takes me to, you know, another, you were talking about going to Washington with your girlfriend and, and putting that menu up in place that again, just when we're in these relationships with, with people, whether it's a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a friendship or a family member of any, any kind. So many people, even my Aspies, and I'm talking to everybody, I'm talking to my Aspies and my neurotypical folks, have the tendency to want other people to be more like themselves. They, the, the tendency is to want you to be more like me. Well, that's an ego thing. You know that. Well, I, I, I don't think it's just ego. I think sometimes it's that, that theory of mind thing that you've probably heard me talk about some. It's this this inability to recognize that the world that someone else's perspective in their world is, is just really drastically different than mine. And so 
it's hard to even imagine that my world makes so much sense to me. My world is the only world, the, the only perspective I have. And so it's hard to imagine that your world is any different than mine. That's called theory of mind it, or cognitive empathy. And so some people just really can't fathom that you don't like the foods that you won't, you know, if, if I like butter on my potato, I can't fathom that you wouldn't like butter on your potato. So try it, try it, just try it. You'll like it. And then some people go even an ex the, the extra mile of, of feeling criticized or insulted if, if somebody won't try it their way. And so we all have to recognize that our way is our way and our partner, our friend, our family member is their way. And that it's not, you know, we're not in the wrong or we're not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with us if they're different and there's nothing wrong with them if they're different. Go ahead, Bo. Well, I was going to say that I've lived long enough and felt different long enough that I, that I, I remember what it's like to be in the minority view on things enough that I wouldn't, I myself would, you know, I, I tried my best not to um, expect someone to do things my way. And I, I always, so when I was looking for a partner in the past, I was looking for someone who was very similar to me, kind of like what you're talking about, but it wasn't so that, um, it, it was mainly because if we're in the car, there wouldn't be any disagreements about what we're listening to because we both like the same kind of music. Or if we watch some television, we want to watch the same kind of movies or television shows. Basically, I didn't want my way. I wanted to be our way because we both had mm -hmm. similar views and needs and an interest in interesting in books or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's sort of the same kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think I know that some of my neurotypical partners have, well, really some of my autistic partners, both I've seen both struggle with some codependency, which is that this compulsive chronic need to meet the needs of others and to, to make sure that the others are okay. And also to kind of attach our identity I say our, because I, I consider myself a recovering codependent to attach our identity to someone else's, to someone else, that to them being okay. And sometimes that together, what you just described of it's, it's us. And sometimes that becomes a problem in the relationships though, that, that ability to say, this is me, this is how I am. This is what I want. This is what I like. People are, are afraid to, to speak up and say that this just came up in the group this week I, and I, I can't remember if you made a comment on on the on a post in the group this week I want to say maybe you did speak up um where somebody uh, I don't remember if it was the same post but somebody was um was expressing to her husband or her partner that she hadn't had coffee in a long time right they, 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 yeah yeah. I, yeah she said I hadn't have I hadn't had, they're, they're traveling I think on the road and she said I haven't had coffee in a while and it'd be nice to have coffee and and then she felt really um, hurt that he didn't stop. He didn't stop to get coffee. And, but yet she didn't specifically say, I would like some coffee. Right. Let's, let's stop to get coffee. And there's this perception that if somebody really loves me, they're in tune to my every need and wish and want. And they would know that, that even though I didn't articulate it, that that's, that'd be a kind thing to do. But or just even the implied meaning, the inferred meaning, yes, and and that they're hearing what I'm meaning by what I'm saying, and yes, and so we we all have to take responsibility for owning our own identity and There's not being in a you know not expecting our partner to recognize what we're trying to say and and not you know not just knowing what we mean sometimes and also not attaching our identity to our partner because sometimes people want their partners to be what they want them to be in order to you know, basically um feel better about themselves or it, it's it's just an identity crisis type of thing and it, it's we've, we've got to take responsibility for us this is me this is what i like this is what i want and then our partner gets to say well you know i don't like that that's not who i am and, and you know, okay, that's, that's all right. We're different people. Well, at least you have clarity then whenever someone has actually been transparent. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't speak for everyone. I've only lived my own life. 
But I do know that I've always had a trouble recognizing hints. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, some of that's maybe it's because I'm a man, or maybe some of it's because I'm you know, I, I'm an Aspie. I, I don't know. But for example, when I was five years old, my parents went on a trip to Graceland to see Elvis's uh, home mm-hmm. uh, in Memphis. Memphis. Mm-hmm. And it apparently had been raining in Memphis. And we parked along the side of the road in front of the mansion. I don't know if you ever saw the pictures of the front of his gate or his home. Mm-hmm. But we, we parked the family car in front of the mansion. And I'm going to stop us there. To hear about Bo's interesting experience and story about his trip to Graceland, be sure to tune in to part two, which will be next week. Bo and I go on to talk about a lot of other things about neurodiversity, executive functioning, and relationship stuff. So you're not going to want to miss it. Remember to tune in each week for a new episode of your Neurodiverse Relationship Podcast. Now remember, this is your podcast, and I want to talk to you. Share with me your personal experiences with neurodiversity. If you're a professional working with autism, I'd also like to talk to you. To be a guest on the show, the link is in the episode description where you can book a time for a recorded chat with me. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any of the wonderful conversations we're having here and the relationship insights and tips that I have for you. Until next time.